prepare to be gripped by the chilling narratives as we explore the lives and personalities of these victims, the details of the crimes that forever changed their families and communities, and the tireless efforts of law enforcement to seek justice. Through a combination of in-depth research, poignant storytelling, and relevant visual elements, this video aims not only to shed light on the dark underbelly of crime, but also to honor the memory of the innocent souls who were taken too soon. On the evening of Sunday, July 14, 2013, 19-year-old aspiring actress, singer and musician Jesse Blodgett took center stage in a production of Fiddler on the Roof to the delight of a packed house in Hartford, Wisconsin. It was clear to everyone in attendance that she loved the spotlight, and the spotlight loved her. After taking their final bows, the cast and crew had gathered together for a pool party to celebrate their successful adaptation of the popular musical. While the outgoing and popular young woman had thoroughly enjoyed herself early on, the disturbing behavior of two of her fellow actors had cast a pall over her evening. Later that night, Jessie had taken to her journal to vent her frustrations. She lamented the fact that she was being corrupted by some of the men in her life, whom she felt were mistaking her friendly nature for something more. She had concluded the entry with the optimistic declaration, I am not helpless, I will recognize problems and confront them without fear. God be with me. Before retiring to bed, she told her mother Joy that two men at the party, who were both well into their forties, had made passes at her. She had elaborated by sharing that one of them had been so aggressive that he had pulled her onto his lap against her will. She wondered aloud why it seemed impossible for members of the opposite sex to simply be friends and nothing more. Her words would prove particularly ominous in light of what was to come. At 8 o'clock the next morning, Joy had looked in on her only child to make sure that everything was alright. Seeing that she was fast asleep, she had headed off to work. Her husband, Buck, had left earlier, leaving Jesse to hold down the fort. When noontime rolled around, Joy returned home for lunch, as was her usual routine. Upon entering the house, she noticed that Jessie hadn't stirred yet. Since she knew that one of her daughter's piano students would be showing up at any minute for the scheduled lesson, her mother had gone upstairs to rouse her. When she cracked open the bedroom door and called her name, Jessie had failed to respond. Figuring that she was worn out from the previous night's activities, she had approached the bed and given her daughter's shoulder a gentle shake. As she made contact, the iciness of the skin beneath her hand had sent shivers running down her spine. Pulling back the covers, she saw the unnatural bluish hue that had consumed the teenager's delicate features. It was then that the horror of the situation suddenly took hold. As her mind struggled to process what she was seeing, she noticed that Jessie's hair and nightclothes were soaking wet. With her heart pounding out of her chest, Joy had called both 911 and her husband Buck to tell them that she feared Jessie was dead. While she waited for help to arrive, her eyes fixed on the ligature marks that were evident on her daughter's neck. Although she found the thought impossible to conceive, she was slowly coming to terms with the realization that a monster had been inside their home that morning. Within minutes, the house was swarming with first responders. As they were securing the scene, Buck joined his wife in their shared nightmare. As the couple were watching the surreal events unfold, they learned that Jessie had more than likely been strangled to death. Deep abrasions on her wrists indicated that she had been bound at some point during the ordeal. Investigators soon determined that an intruder had entered the residence earlier that morning through an unlocked door after Joy departed for work. After making his way to Jessie's room, he had incapacitated her by tying her hands together before subjecting her to a particularly brutal rape. When the perpetrator was finished, he had used a ligature to end her life. The assumption from the get-go was that the killer was someone known to the family. Detectives theorized that only an individual who was familiar with the Blodgett's comings and goings would have known that they seldom locked their doors, believing that it wasn't necessary, since they lived in a neighborhood where crime of any kind was virtually unheard of. It was also telling that whoever entered the house that morning uninvited had known that Jesse would be the only one home between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m., giving them ample time to carry out their deadly plan. Starting at square one, investigators looked through Jesse's journal in the hopes that she had mentioned being fearful of someone in her inner, or outer, circle. When they saw the entry detailing how the actor had manhandled her the previous night, they sought him out for questioning. 
Upon discovering that he had called off work on Monday morning, their interest in him went through the roof. When they spoke to the man in question, he admitted that he had overstepped his boundaries, but contended that he meant no harm. After providing detectives with a solid alibi, he was cleared of any wrongdoing. To cross all their T's, they also interviewed the other party goer who had made Jesse uncomfortable. He too was quickly eliminated as a suspect. With their two promising persons of interest no longer viable, investigators cast a wire net in their quest to catch a killer. In what was initially believed to be an unrelated incident, three days before Jesse was murdered, a young woman named Melissa Etzler was walking her dog in a nature park in nearby Richfield when she was attacked by a knife-wielding stranger. Melissa recalled that as she and her dog passed by a fan parked in the visitor's area, a man had jumped out and tackled her from behind. As he raised a knife and tried to stab her, she had grabbed the blade and refused to let go. The two had struggled for control of the weapon for a while before Melissa was able to wrench it from his hand. When he realized that his intended victim was now in control, the would-be assailant had nervously blurted out, Can I just go? Stunned by the ridiculous request, Melissa had informed him that he wasn't going anywhere as she quickly phoned police. Unfortunately, she couldn't stop him from running to his vehicle and speeding away, though she made sure to keep the knife in her possession. When officers arrived on the scene, they were shocked by the sight of Melissa's hands, which had been shredded by the blade of the fillet knife as she held onto it for dear life. Keeping her wits about her despite the traumatic events that had just taken place, Melissa went on to give a remarkably detailed description of her assailant. She recalled that he was a white male with sandy blonde hair, pale skin, 18 to 20 years of age, 6 feet 2 inches, around 210 pounds, and wearing plaid shorts. She also knew the color, make and model of the vehicle he had driven, a dark blue, older model, Dodge Caravan. After giving her statement, she had been whisked away to the nearest hospital. When all was said and done, it had taken 15 stitches to close the wounds to her fingers and palms. When the description of the attacker and his mode of transportation were shared with other law enforcement agencies in the district, a deputy who routinely patrolled the park came forward to say that he was certain that he had seen the van in the very same spot a few weeks earlier. Although the driver wasn't technically doing anything wrong, something about him had made him feel uneasy. As a precaution, he had run the plates, meaning that the owner's name was now on record. When investigators in Melissa's case checked out this promising lead, they were disappointed to find that the van's owner was a middle-aged man who couldn't possibly have been the perpetrator. However, after learning that he had a teenage son, they felt that they might be on the right track after all. When detectives sat down with the registered owner, they found him to be a font of information. After offering to help in any way he could, he told investigators that his 20-year-old son Dan often drove the van. Their interest was further heightened when they learned that the blonde-haired young man stood at an impressive 6 feet 1 inch and weighed in at 200 pounds. Though Dan Bartelt wasn't home at the time, his father had provided detectives with his cell phone number in order to clear up any misunderstanding without further delay. In an odd coincidence that hadn't seemed particularly significant at the time, when they reached their potential suspect, he was attending a vigil for Jessie Blodgett at her parents' house. As it turned out, Dan and Jessie had been classmates in high school and had even dated briefly. While their romantic endeavor hadn't worked out, their friendship had remained on solid ground while past graduation. Bonded together in part by their mutual love of musical theater, the pair were the best of friends. Others who were present on the day of Jesse's memorial remembered seeing Dan taking the call from police. After ending the communication, he had nonchalantly announced to the group of mourners that he had to go meet with detectives about something or other. And with that, he had given joy and bought one last hug, dried his eyes, and headed out the door with their blessing. On their end, detectives were struck by the fact that Dan hadn't asked why they wanted to speak with him. In their experience, it was unusual for anyone to agree to come down to the station so readily. While his surprising lack of curiosity certainly wasn't a crime, it had given them pause. As soon as Dan sat down with investigators, they got straight to the point, asking him where he was on the morning that Melissa was attacked. His alibi was that he had spent the entire day with his good friend Jesse Blodgett who, tragically, was now deceased. 
Seizing on this unexpected opportunity, detectives asked him what he knew about the events that had taken place in the Blodgett's home on that fateful Monday morning. Without missing a beat, he replied that Jessie had been raped and murdered in her bedroom. After giving Dan a quick once-over, investigators couldn't help but notice that he had multiple cuts and abrasions on his hands and arms that appeared to be fresh. When they inquired as to the nature of the injuries, he had shrugged them off as the result of a minor accident at work. What detectives knew that Dan didn't was that his father had already told them that he was unemployed. After catching him in a blatant lie, they pressed him to come clean. Upon reflection, he suddenly recalled that he had cut his hand and forearm in a cooking mishap. Skeptical of this story as well, investigators let him know in no uncertain terms that his feeble attempt at an explanation didn't ring true. After all, there was no shame in being a clumsy chef and, therefore, no reason to lie. After taking a deep breath, Dan confessed to the attack on Melissa. He elaborated by saying that he often went to the park to write in peace. It seemed that he had been working on a novel for years and he found the setting conducive to his creativity. He explained that oftentimes when his parents thought he was in school or working, he was actually sitting in the van, people watching and toiling away at what he envisioned would be his magnum opus. When asked what made him decide to attack an innocent girl walking her dog, the coldness of his reply had chilled the room. According to him, he had merely wanted to scare someone. A ne'er-do-well who was a jobless college dropout with no plans for the future, he explained that he had been so frightened by the world around him that he wanted to release his growing fear onto someone else. With his admissions in hand, detectives placed Dan under arrest for aggravated assault. Although they were now aware that he had been close to Jesse Blodgett, they had no reason to believe that her murder and the attack in the park were related, but they soon would. Since the interview with Dan had taken place early on in the investigation into the Blodgett homicide, detectives working Melissa's case weren't aware that Jesse had been raped. While they had been in the dark, the young man they were interrogating in regard to an entirely different matter had readily offered up that important bit of information. Since only the perpetrator would have known about the sexual assault, Dan's slip of the tongue had put him at the top of the suspect list once the autopsy results were made available to members of local law enforcement. When he was questioned about Jesse's murder, Dan had denied any involvement, which had come as a surprise to no one. After obtaining a warrant to search his personal belongings, investigators found disturbing images on his computer that had allowed them to look into the dark inner workings of his mind. Among other things, he had routinely looked up materials relating to serial killers and their methods. Disturbingly, he had also searched for snuff films, which are underground offerings that allegedly show a victim usually female, being raped and murdered live on camera. Various other pornographic images were found on his electronic devices, many of which depicted violence against women. In one of the videos he viewed, a woman is seen being raped and strangled by a killer who then washes her body and places her back in bed, covering her with a blanket as if she's only sleeping. It wasn't lost on detectives that the sickening acts being portrayed on film eerily mirrored what happened to Jesse in what should have been the safety of her own bedroom. Even when confronted with this damning evidence, Dan refused to budge. He did, however, amend his story. Now, instead of being close friends, he claimed that he and Jesse had rekindled their romantic relationship in the weeks leading up to her death. He explained that he hadn't wanted to say anything before out of respect for his girlfriend, who didn't know that he was seeing someone else. He had gone on to say that he had told his parents that he was going to work on the morning of the murder, when actuality, he had spent most of the day either riding at Woodlawn Union Park or driving around aimlessly. When detectives checked out CCTV footage taken at the park, it confirmed that he had been on the grounds on July 15th. For once, it seemed that he had been telling the truth. On a hunch, investigators had paid a visit to the park where they searched the trash bins for evidence. Inside one of the cans, they found a cereal box containing a ball gag, a device often used in BDSM, bondage, discipline, sadism, masochism, to stifle the screams of the wearer ligatures, and several blood-soaked disinfectant wipes. Lengths of rope were also discovered among the refuse which were later matched to the marks on Jesse's neck. With the case against Dan Bartelt heating up by the minute, a search warrant was executed on his family's residence. 
In addition to finding more of the same style of rope in the garage, investigators found tape on the air ducts that matched discarded samples Joy discovered under her daughter's bed in the days after the murder, as well as strips retrieved from the scene of Melissa Etzler's botched abduction. When the various pieces of tape were examined by forensics experts, they were found to be covered with Dan's fingerprints. The evidence being collected painted a terrifying picture of Jesse's last moments. From what they could gather, detectives were convinced that Dan had entered the residence shortly after Joy left for work. Once inside, he had crept up to Jesse's room where he hogtied her and placed a ball gag in her mouth, securing it with tape. He had then raped her before strangling her to death with rope he had brought along for that very purpose. When he was sure that she was dead, he had washed her hair and body in an attempt to destroy evidence. After placing her back in bed and covering her with a blanket, he had headed to the park to dispose of the implements of his crime. Little did he know that the alibi he provided when the law came calling would lead to his undoing when it was discovered that the items were still in the park's trash bins days later. To solidify the case against him, Dan's DNA matched the samples taken from Jesse's rape kit, as well as those that had been scraped from under her fingernails. To hammer the final nail in his coffin, both his DNA and that of his victim were confirmed to be present on the ligatures. On July 31, 2013, Dan Bartelt was officially charged with the first-degree intentional homicide of Jesse Blodgett. In addition, he was also held over for trial for attempted first-degree murder, first-degree reckless endangerment and false imprisonment in relation to the attack on Melissa Etzler. On October 14, 2014, a jury of his peers deliberated for three hours before finding Bartelt guilty of Jesse's murder. He was subsequently sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It was a victory for the victim's family, as well as the prosecutor who described the defendant as the most dangerous criminal he had ever met. When Bartelt was given a chance to speak at his sentencing, he had used the opportunity to plead his innocence, telling Jesse's family who had always treated him like a son that the prison uniform and restraints don't make me guilty. He offered no apologies, even as Jesse's father forgave him in open court for his unspeakable acts. In exchange for pleading guilty to the charges of attempting to abduct and murder Melissa Etzler, Bartelt was sentenced to a paltry five years behind bars, with an additional five years of supervision tacked on for good measure. Thankfully, since he will never again walk the streets a free man, these determinations were more or less symbolic. In September of 2017, Bartelt appealed the verdict in Jesse's case to the Wisconsin Supreme Court on the grounds that he had provided information to detectives that was then used against him without a lawyer present. After completing a careful review of the tactics used by investigators during the course of their search for answers in the death of Jesse Blodgett, the court upheld Bartelt's guilty verdict. As of August 2023, he is being housed at the Wappen Correctional Facility in West Bend, Wisconsin, where he will remain, barring anything unforeseen, for the rest of his natural life. The horrifying details of what happened in Jesse's room on that dreadful morning will probably always be shrouded in mystery. Since the only living witness exists in a perpetual state of denial, odds are that he will never expose the depths of his depravity to the light. What isn't in doubt is that the terror that Jessie must have felt when she realized that she was about to die at the hands of someone she both loved and trusted is unimaginable. Sadly, despite the countless hours they had spent together over the years, she had never really known him at all. Although her life had come to a tragic end, Jessie Blodgett had made every minute of her short time on earth count. A gifted singer and all-around performer, she was planning on pursuing a career in the arts at the time of her death. To earn extra money, she had worked as a children's piano and violin instructor. Her innate goodness and patience had endeared her to her students and their parents alike. Besides her love of music in all its forms, the University of Wisconsin sophomore was a staunch supporter of such causes as animal rights and environmental protection. She was also an anti-bullying advocate in school and, ironically, an outspoken warrior against domestic violence, especially among high school and college students. Although Jessie didn't live to see the social changes she envisioned come to pass, the loved ones she left behind are determined to see to it that she did not die in vain. To that end, in 2016, her father Buck established the Love Hate Project in her honor.
The organization's mission statement includes their pledge to work towards ending male-on-female violence, inspiring love over hate through education and social programs aimed at teaching those with aggressive tendencies better ways to channel their energy. In the end, how high Jessie would have flown had she been given the chance will never be known. That her life was taken by an individual who had worn the guise of a friend, when he was in fact her worst enemy, is yet another sad factor in this unsettling case. The Horrific Torture and Murders of Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom Fifteen years ago today, a train conductor passing through Knoxville, Tennessee, made a shocking discovery on the railroad tracks on 9th Avenue, the bound, burned body of 23-year-old Christopher Newsom. He had been beaten, raped, and shot. Three days later, the body of his 21-year-old girlfriend, Shannon Christian, was found stuffed inside a trash can in a nearby home. She had been beaten, raped, and bleach poured down her throat before she suffocated inside the trash can with a plastic bag over her head. Five people, including one female, were arrested and convicted of their murders. Shannon Christian moved from Louisiana to Tennessee in 1997. She graduated high school and attended the University of Tennessee Knoxville where she majored in sociology. Shannon was set to graduate in December 2007. Christopher Newsom Jr. worked as a carpenter. Friends introduced him to Shannon and the pair began dating in November 2006. Their relationship blossomed over the months. Friends and family described them as the perfect couple. On January 6, 2007, Shannon visited a friend at the Washington Ridge Apartments. She and Christopher planned to go to dinner and then attend a party with friends later in the evening. At about 8 p.m. Shannon's friend headed to the party. Christopher arrived at the apartment complex to pick her up. What happened next shocked locals as well as the true crime community. Christopher embraced Shannon in a kiss outside his SUV when he arrived at the apartment complex. As the two held each other closely, five people approached, forced them into the back seat of the SUV at gunpoint, bound their hands behind their backs, and drove to Davidson's rented home at 2316 Chipman Street. The Five Perpetrators La Marcus Devali, Eric Dwayne, George Giovanni, Latifus Darnell, Vanessa Lynn Coleman. When Christopher arrived at the apartment complex, he embraced Shannon beside his vehicle and passionately kissed her. As this took place, five individuals approached the couple forced them into the back seat of Christian's SUV at gunpoint, tied and bound their hands behind their backs, and drove to the rented home of Davidson located at 2316 Chipman Street. While at the Chipman Street home, Christopher was brutally beaten and sodomized with an unknown object by at least one person. After torturing Christopher for several hours, the group placed a dog leash around his neck and drug him wearing only socks and a pair of underwear to the railroad tracks. The crew bound Christopher's hands and feet behind his back, blindfolded him with a bandana, and gagged him with a sock. He was shot in the neck and in the back. He survived these two shots, but a third shot with the muzzle placed against his right ear proved fatal, as it severed his brain stem. Finally, the group lit Christopher's body afire and retreated back to the home at Chipman Street where Shannon was bound inside one of the bedrooms. Coleman watched over her while the rest of the group took Christopher to the railroad tracks. At the home, the men of the group hogtied Christian, then took turns repeatedly vaginally and anally raping and beating Shannon. The crew poured bleach down Shannon's throat and scrubbed her body with the chemical, including her battered genital area. Hours later, Shannon suffered severe head injuries and severe injuries to her vagina, anus, and mouth. Most of Shannon's body was covered in bruises and carpet burns. Shannon cried to her assailants before she died, telling them she did not want to die. After Shannon's death, the killers placed her body in trash bags inside a trash can. Each of them went on to do other things. Davidson left the Chipman Street home to spend time with his girlfriend. Davidson gave his girlfriend several pieces of jewelry and other gifts he removed from Shannon's body before stuffing her into the trash can. On January 7, 2007, at about 12.20 p.m., a train conductor found Christopher's body on the tracks. A comforter had been wrapped around his head. 
A witness told police she witnessed a forerunner with four black men inside drive by his house near the railroad tracks on the night of the murder. Evidence found nearby Christopher's body led police to the home on Chipman Street where they discovered Shannon's body. She wore only a camisole and sweater. She was stuffed into five large trash bags and stuffed inside a trash can in a fetal position and covered with sheets. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy on Shannon said the sexual attack went beyond a simple sexual assault. She died of suffocation after the assailants stuffed her into the trash bags in the trash can. An autopsy of Christopher's body found evidence he had been sodomized. Semen was found on his body, but DNA evidence had been destroyed by the fire. Along with Shannon's body, police discovered other items belonging to Shannon and Christopher. DNA evidence recovered from these items matched Davidson's. Evidence included sperm found on Christian's jeans and Cobbin's sperm on her jeans, camisole, and sweater. A manhunt for Davidson began. Police recovered phone calls that eventually led them to Boyd. Speaking to police, Boyd provided them with a location of a vacant house where Davidson had been staying. Boyd was not charged with a crime at this time. Police took Davidson into custody immediately after locating him at the vacant home. He provided the police with five different versions of events from the night of the murders, but his testimony combined with physical evidence connected Thomas, Coleman, and Coppins to the murders. Police took them into custody in Lebanon, Kentucky. Coppins then confessed to the crime. Coleman then confessed but claimed she had been held hostage by the other group members. Thomas, Davidson, Cobbins and Coleman were tried separately in 2009. Boyd was found guilty in federal court of the charge of being an accessory to a fatal carjacking and failing to report the location of a fugitive. He was sentenced to a maximum of 18 years. Latifus Coleman was convicted of double murder. He was found guilty of murder but acquitted of rape and sentenced to life without parole. Lamarcus Davidson was found guilty of two counts of murder. He was sentenced to death plus an additional 80 years on rape and other related charges. George Thomas was found guilty of murder and sentenced to four life sentences without parole. Vanessa Coleman was granted immunity for her testimony in the case against the other defendants. She was acquitted of first-degree murder and found guilty of manslaughter and other charges. She was sentenced to 53 years in prison. All four defendants were granted new trials after the judge in the case, Richard Baumgartner of Knox County Criminal Cootie, was forced to resign. The Tennessee Supreme Court overturned the ruling ordering new trials for Thomas, Davidson, and Cobbins. In 2012, a judge again granted new trials for the trio, although a senior judge later denied new trials for Cobbins and Davidson. During her retrial, Coleman was convicted of aggravated kidnapping, facilitation of rape, and facilitation of murder. She was sentenced to 35 years in prison. George Thomas was found guilty of 38 counts during his retrial and resentenced to life in prison but this time, with the possibility of parole after 51 years. Regina Armstrong and her sister, Christina, were dropped off by their father at their babysitter's apartment early on the morning of Tuesday, June 18, 1985. Their babysitter lived in the Semarin Terrace Apartments in Orlando, Florida, and the siblings spent much of the day playing with the babysitter's younger brother in the parking lot of the apartment complex. Around noon, the children were approached by a strange man who tried to start a conversation with them, but he left after a few minutes and the children continued playing. The man returned around 3 p.m., and this time he convinced six-year-old Regina to take a walk with him. She never returned. According to the two older children, the man had told them that he would give them money if they would sit on a bench and watch the entrance of a nearby apartment for him. He then invited Regina to accompany him while he went to pick up his grandchildren, who he said were about her age. He promised to bring her back to the apartment complex within half an hour, and Regina said she would be happy to go with him. She was last seen walking alongside the unidentified man, barefoot and wearing a sundress. Christina and the babysitter's brother walked over to the bench and sat down, but within a few minutes, they seemed to realize that something wasn't right about the situation. They ran to the babysitter's apartment and tried to get inside, but the door was locked. They yelled for the babysitter to let them in, 
telling her that Regina had been kidnapped, but she didn't believe them and yelled for them to stop fooling around. The babysitter finally opened the door and Christina raced inside and grabbed the phone, intent on calling 911. Incredibly, the babysitter's boyfriend grabbed the phone out of her hand and hung it up, telling the nine-year-old, if she's gone, it's your fault. He and the babysitter told the kids to stay in the apartment and they would go find Regina, but they refused to allow the police to be involved, clearly worried that they would get in trouble since the abduction had happened when they were supposed to be watching the kids. About an hour later, the children's mother arrived to pick up her daughters. As Donna Armstrong knocked on the apartment door, she could hear Christina wailing hysterically inside. She threw herself into her mother's arms and sobbed that Regina had been kidnapped and the babysitter was out searching for her. Donna immediately called the Orlando Police Department and reported her daughter missing. Nearly 70 police officers were dispatched to the southeast Orlando neighborhood, and they scoured the area for any sign of the missing girl. Around midnight, some of the officers went home to get some sleep, but more than two dozen refused to stop their search and continued throughout the night. They found no clues to Regina's whereabouts. Christina and the babysitter's son were able to provide detectives with a detailed description of the suspected abductor. They stated he was a white male in his early 30s, with dark brown or black bushy hair. He was about six feet tall and had a sore or cut on his lip, they thought he might have been missing a couple of his teeth. He had been dressed in faded blue jeans and a blue, brown, and white checkered shirt with silver snaps, and he had a gold watch on one wrist. A sketch artist quickly developed a composite sketch that was released to the news media. The search intensified Wednesday morning, with officers going door to door throughout the neighborhood, hoping to find someone who had witnessed a man talking to the children the previous day. They distributed missing person flyers with pictures of Regina as well as a sketch of the suspect, and found several witnesses who recalled seeing the man. One woman told detectives that she saw Regina walking alongside the man around 3.30 p.m., they were headed in the direction of Englewood Park, about six blocks away from the apartment complex where Regina had been playing. Another woman saw a man matching the description of the abductor dragging a young girl in the same area. Police searched the park and surrounding buildings, but found no sign of Regina or her kidnapper. Bob Armstrong spoke to reporters Wednesday afternoon, he had spent the morning taking part in the search for his missing daughter. He pleaded for her safe return, tearfully asking for the abductor to release the six-year-old. Her mother and I miss her. We love her. We want her back safely. He stated that he and Donna were offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to Regina's safe return. Donna said that she didn't blame the babysitter for Regina's abduction, she was more concerned with finding her daughter. I just want my baby back. Both she and Bob were still struggling to comprehend the situation. Bob told reporters, I don't know why anyone would want to take her. My wife and I are almost at the end of our rope. You see accounts on television where this happens to other children, but you never think it will happen to your own child. Bob also had a message for his daughter. Gina, daddy's not mad at you. You haven't done anything wrong. Please, please, come home. He told reporters that Regina knew her home address and telephone number and he was certain she would contact her parents if she were able to get to a phone. All he could do was pray that she would call. Betty Bowers, a spokesperson for the Orlando Police Department, assured reporters that they were doing everything possible to find the missing girl. Wednesday's search had included the use of tracking dogs, horses, and helicopters. We have every available officer out there searching. By Thursday, Regina's missing poster and the sketch of the suspect could be seen hanging in the window of just about every business in Orlando. Investigators were flooded with tips concerning potential sightings of both Regina and her abductor. More than 500 phone calls came in during the first 72 hours of the investigation, but they were unable to develop any substantial leads. Orlando Police Detective Marion Waits told reporters that police just needed one good tip to help them locate Regina. We want to believe that she is alive. And I believe we will find her. The biggest break, we believe, will come from the public, from someone who will spot Regina or the man who took her. What we need now is for everyone to keep their eyes and ears open, 
and if they see anyone matching the descriptions to call us immediately. By Friday afternoon, volunteers had helped distribute more than 250,000 missing posters in both Orlando and several surrounding towns. They could be seen at toll booths, in restaurants and gas stations, and at rest stops along major highways. Throughout the weekend, the phones at police headquarters were constantly ringing as people continued to call with potential sightings. Officers were kept busy answering as many as 40 calls an hour, although many of the tips were vague, each one had to be thoroughly checked out to make sure nothing was missed. Unfortunately, none of the tips led to Regina or her abductor. On Tuesday, June 25, 1985, Investigators and more than 220 Navy cadets launched a three-day search of an 18-square-mile area of central Florida that included abandoned buildings, swamps, woods, creeks, and canals. They hadn't received any specific tips leading them to the area, but it hadn't been searched during the initial search effort and they wanted to make sure nothing was missed. On Wednesday, they uncovered the skeleton of an adult male who had been dead for about a year, but they found no sign of Regina. While police were busy searching central Florida, John Walsh, the father of murdered Florida toddler Adam Walsh, gave the case some national exposure by showing Regina's picture and the sketch of the suspect during an appearance on the Today Show. He had been scheduled to speak on the show before Regina disappeared, and after he learned of her disappearance he called her parents and assured them that he would do everything he could to help them find their daughter. While the physical search failed to produce any clues to Regina's whereabouts, police remained hopeful that they would be able to find her. Orlando Police Lieutenant Don Glass noted, Right now, we are optimistic that she is alive. She might have been taken by someone who wanted a family of his own. Until we find evidence otherwise, we will investigate the case as if she is still alive. Potential sightings of Regina and her abductor continue to be reported to police. More than 200 calls came in on June 28 and June 29 but none of the sightings could be confirmed. Two teenagers were certain they saw the pair at an Orlando fast food restaurant, but they left in a beige car before the teens could call police. Another witness thought she saw Regina and her kidnapper at an amusement park. Investigators followed up on each sighting, but none of them led to Regina. Two weeks before Regina's abduction, there had been an attempted kidnapping of a seven-year-old girl in Cocoa Beach, Florida and investigators believe the two cases could be related. In the Cocoa Beach case, a nine-year-old girl had woken up in the middle of the night to see a man attempting to carry her younger sister out of their bedroom window. Her screams woke up her parents, who rushed into the children's bedroom. The man escaped through the window, but he dropped the seven-year-old girl. The suspect sketch produced in that case was very similar to the one in Regina's case. When the nine-year-old girl saw a news story about Regina's abduction, she was certain that the man who took Regina was the same one who had tried to take her sister. Detectives were desperate to find the man before he could abduct another child. The physical search for Regina and her abductor was the largest one in Orlando's history in terms of manpower, with hundreds of volunteers assisting naval cadets and police in combing the area. By the time they finished, they had uncovered a marijuana patch, dozens of articles of clothing, earrings, rattlesnakes, stray cats, tons of trash, and even a hidden hutch of fighting roosters, which were quickly turned over to animal control. They found no clues to Regina's whereabouts or the identity of her kidnapper. Investigators continued to follow up on dozens of reported sightings of Regina and her abductor, and they told reporters that there were so many sightings of the pair that they felt confident they were still in the Orlando area. A few witnesses saw the pair in a brown car, possibly an Oldsmobile Delta 88, Several witnesses claimed that there were two men with Regina in the car. Regina's parents struggled to remain optimistic as weeks passed without any word from their missing daughter. Bob was hopeful that the fact that her remains hadn't been found meant that she was still alive and being held captive by her abductor. We figure now this means he still has her, they're out there somewhere and she's fine. And until we know, we'll keep on believing that she's alright. A month after the abduction, the number of investigators assigned to the case was cut from 35 to 16. The number of tips had dwindled to about 15 a day, and Orlando Police Captain George McNamara told reporters that it was time to free up detectives to work on other cases. We still have a lot more things we can do, but we have gotten way behind on other cases that we need to get back to. 
There were no new leads to report over the next couple of weeks, and investigators said it was possible that the abductor had taken Regina out of the Orlando area. On August 1, 1985, a man riding a bus in San Pedro, California was certain he saw Regina on the bus. She was with a man who was acting suspiciously, he kept pulling the little girl closer to him and she appeared to be frightened of him. Following the bus sighting, there were six more reports of a girl matching Regina's description in the Los Angeles, California area. Each witness described the little girl as wearing a blue and green flowered sundress similar to the one Regina had been wearing when she vanished, and many of the witnesses said the little girl wasn't wearing shoes. Bob and Donna found the reported sightings to be credible, so much so that they flew to Los Angeles hoping to be able to find their daughter and bring her home. Along with police officers, they blanketed the area with missing posters and asked people to be on the lookout for Regina. Police were eventually able to identify the child seen by witnesses and confirm that, though she looked a lot like Regina, she was not the missing girl. Heartbroken, Bob and Donna returned to Florida. Months went by, and the case began to go cold. In February 1986, volunteers collected more than $37,000 in donations to pay for 100 billboards located throughout the southeastern United States. Each one displayed a picture of Regina and a sketch of her abductor, as well as information about the case and the reward being offered. Investigators were hopeful that the billboards would bring in some new tips, but only a few potential leads were received. On the first anniversary of his daughter's disappearance, Bob told reporters that he and Donna were still praying that they would be reunited with Regina. In a way, it seems like forever and in another way, it seems like yesterday. Everything that happened on June 18th is vivid in our minds, but when you think about how long she has not been here, it seems like a lifetime. He still dreamed about finding her. I would love to see her. I would probably squeeze her so tight, I would knock the wind out of her, I would give my life to see her again. Detective Marion Waite said that the Orlando Police Department had followed up on more than 2,700 tips over the past year, and not one of them had led them to Regina. I was hoping we would find her within a couple of days. She is out there. It is just a question of finding out where she is. Until we find a body or some bones or remains, she is still alive as far as we are concerned. On September 10, 1987, a construction crew in Oviedo, Florida, discovered a child's skull and the tattered remains of a flowered sundress when they were breaking ground for a new housing development. They immediately stopped construction on the site and called the Oviedo Police Department, who came out and recovered the remains. Incredibly, despite the fact that Oviedo was just 20 miles away from where Regina was abducted, Oviedo Police failed to connect the remains to her and didn't bother to notify the Orlando Police Department of the find. The bones would remain unidentified until July 1988, when Dennis Peterson, a former Orlando Police Lieutenant, became the Chief of Police in Oviedo. As he settled into his new position, he spent some time going through the evidence locker and saw the tiny sundress. He immediately recognized it as the one Regina had been wearing when she was last seen. For some reason, former Oviedo Police Chief R. Wade Hancock had never bothered to notify anyone about the discovery of human remains. State Attorney Robert Egan admitted, this is the most incompetent piece of police work I've seen in my 20 years in this business. During his investigation into the mishandling of the case, he learned that a Florida Department of Law Enforcement analyst who had been called to the construction site repeatedly told Hancock that he thought the remains could be linked to Regina's case, and Hancock assured him he would contact detectives in Orlando, then failed to do so. Donna Armstrong viewed the sundress and confirmed that it belonged to her daughter, ending years of speculation that Regina was still alive. State Attorney Egan was frustrated by how long the remains had been sitting in the evidence locker. Here we have a missing child, murdered as it turns out, and now the trail is absolutely cold. There's no way of saying what might have been if they had handled it properly. Regina's family members were extremely angry about the situation, noting that they had been forced to wait an extra 10 months for answers due to the incompetence of the Oviedo Police Department. The discovery provided some measure of closure but no answers, as the medical examiner was unable to determine how Regina had died. Sadly, 
Bob and Donna's marriage fell apart in the months following Regina's disappearance, and by the time her body was found they had divorced. They set aside their differences to plan a memorial service for their youngest child, and they would frequently visit her grave in Orlando's Woodlawn Cemetery. Both of them hoped that her killer would one day be brought to justice, but police never made any progress in identifying the man who abducted and murdered Regina. Regina May Armstrong was just six years old when she was abducted and murdered in Orlando, Florida in June 1985. She was a sweet and friendly child who adored her older sister and was constantly hugging her parents. She was abducted by a white male in his early 30s, around six feet tall, who had an open sore on his lip and may have been missing a few teeth. Despite numerous reported sightings of the man in the months following Regina's abduction, he has never been identified. As we conclude our journey through these tragic tales, we are reminded that while these crimes shattered lives, they also ignited a fierce determination to seek justice, to honor the memories of those who are no longer with us, and to create a world where such atrocities become lessons rather than recurring nightmares. May their spirits find peace, and may we strive for a world where innocence is cherished, and such tragic tales become relics of the past.